Oh, good morning, everyone. So good to be back. Uh, had a wonderful time at uh, my niece's wedding in Atlanta last Sunday, and it was so good to see my nieces and nephews. Uh, got to see them. I hadn't seen them in like 20 years, so they were only like five and eight, six and seven and eight years old somewhere in there, and now they're all grown up getting married and doing productive things in our society, and so it was a real blessing. And also, I got to see Kelly's two sisters, uh, Tommy Sue's her older sister, and Lisa is her younger sister, and so it was a blessing, and, and uh, I'm sure that uh, um, uh, Victor was awesome, Victor Hartsfield, our missionary to Cambodia, I'm sure that he was uh, just on fire like he always is, and so, all right, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 1. We're going to look at 1 John 1 first, then we're going to look at 1 John 5. We're going to read a few verses in chapter 1 and a few verses in chapter 5. Now, before we read these verses, I want to give you a heads up about 1 John because so many scholars, so many pastors, they believe that 1 John was written so you could test whether you're truly a believer or not that it gives you and I tests that we can take and we can say, ah, I can see, I passed the test, I'm a believer in Jesus. But that is not at all what this book is talking about. In fact, if you try to take those tests, if you're honest, you will flunk the tests and I will flunk the tests because nobody has ever kept those things in their entire lives. We've failed God in these areas. You know, like let me give you a for instance. Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Uh, <laughs> you know what? There's just no hope there because you're always going to be wondering, did I love them enough? Or how about this one? Do you love God with all your heart? And I'm telling you, there's pastors that put it on their congregations. And you know what happens after a sermon like that? Half the congregations down in the front getting saved again because they're honest. The other ones sit there and say, yes, I love God, I love my neighbor, and they take all the other tests and they just, they just think that they're just hunky-dory, you know, that they do that. But you know what? <laughs> the Bible is so crystal clear that eternal life is a free gift, all right? It can't be earned. In fact, Paul even says this. If there was a law that could have given life, then life would have been through the law, but he says, since you can't keep the law, God's made it a gift. And he goes on and explains that. But if there was a law given that you and I could follow, then eternal life would have been by the law. But it is not. And so keep that in mind when you read 1 John. 1 John is a book so you can test whether you are in fellowship with God, whether you're walking with him. All right? It's not a book that tries to test your salvation because we would all flunk that test. Okay, I want you to look at 1 John chapter 1, starting with verse 6. So this is one of the ingredients to fellowship with God. And what is it? It's walking in the light, okay? Whoever walks in darkness, in other words, that means whoever is walking in disobedience is not in fellowship with him. That's easy to understand. Verse 6, if we say, <laughs> we being Christians, if we say that we have fellowship with him, with God, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, now I want you to notice something here. <laughs> it says, if we walk in the light. Notice that John did not say if we walk according to the light. Because again, if he said that, we would all flunk. Because walking according to the light means that you never sin. But he didn't say that. He said if you'll walk in the light, God's shining his light down on you through the word of God, and you're walking in that. You're walking in openness. You're walking in honesty. You're saying, hey, Lord, if I have failed you, open my eyes in your word and show me. That's a big difference. If he had said, are you walking according to it? Uh, we would say, uh, not perfectly. <laughs> no. In fact, 
This past week, you might say, I failed miserably to do that. Okay, so this is beautiful. Verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship. Look, we have fellowship with one another if we walk this way. Is everybody looking at me? <laughs> You're looking in the Bible, that's good. But I'm saying when he says, we, uh, as we walk in the light, as he is, we have fellowship with one another, this fellowship. Now we also have good fellowship uh, horizontally, but here... When you're walking in the light, he's talking about our fellowship with God, okay? Hallelujah. You don't have to be perfect to walk in the light. You have to be open and honest, and we're going to get to that. Uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Wow. When we're in the light, Jesus' blood is cleansing us. If we're walking, not in perfection, but if we're walking in openness and honesty, his blood is covering us so we can have fellowship with God. Now look at verse 8. However, <laughs> if we say that we have no sin, now believe it or not, yes, it's true that there are actually Christians and denominations that believe that you can get to the place in your Christian life where you don't ever sin again. Thank you. I'm hearing laughter and chuckling. That's right, because we ought to say, that ain't right. <laughs> and it's not right, because you know what? We won't be sinless until we see the Lord Jesus Christ. We are always going to be, the devil, our adversary, is always going to be after us. He's always going to be tempting us. He's always going to be lying to us. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So we can't ever get to the place in our Christian life where you say, you know what, I, I don't think I'm sinning anymore. I, I'm so close to God, I don't, I don't sin anymore. Uh, uh, you, just, you just committed the sin of pride, <laughs> right? I don't sin anymore. <laughs> If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. <laughs> you know, we're not walking in the light. We're not walking according to truth. That thing has vamoosed when we start talking like that. Look at verse 9. Boy, I hope you're as happy as I am that this verse is in the Bible. Thank you, Lord. If we, we Christians, if we, God's people, if we confess our sins, that means to acknowledge them. It means in the Greek to say the same thing about them that God says. That's wrong. I shouldn't have done that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, notice this, to forgive us our sins, but it doesn't stop there. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why we can walk in the light because if you confess the sins that you are aware of and he makes you aware of and you're open and honest before God, then Jesus says, well, you have other sins in your life, but I'm just going to go ahead and forgive those as well until you're ready for me to make you aware of those sins as well. Wow. Wow. Okay, so that is a huge, important passage. Now, I want you to go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Chapter 1, how do we stay walking in the light? We stay walking in the light by not deceiving ourselves and saying we don't sin anymore. We keep walking in the light by confessing our sins, by going to God on a regular basis. Lord, man, I failed you. Oh, Lord, I lost my temper. Oh, Lord, I lied. Oh, Lord, you get the idea. Verse 13, these things I have written to you. Okay, now I want you to follow me. In 1 John, the book, multiple times John uses those words. These things I've written to you. And what he's always doing there, he's not talking about the entire epistle. Because the entire epistle, here he's going to talk about assurance of salvation. The entire epistle is not about the assurance of salvation. And in fact, in one place, I've got to recall this from memory, 
John says, I write to these things concerning those who mislead you. I write these things to you that you do not sin. He's got all different purposes for writing. And each one, whenever he reads that, you got to look in the context, right in the immediate context for what he's, when he says, I'm writing these things or uh, these things I have written. Like here it would be verses 1 through, through 12. Because right before that, he's talking about eternal life. Okay, so let's read this with that in mind. John says, these things, verses 1 through 12, I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Is he writing to save people or unsave people? Look at it again. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Save people or lost? Right. Save people. I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, folks, it doesn't get any better than that. If you've believed in the name of the Son of God, you may know that you have eternal life. Didn't say hope. Didn't say think. He said, I've written these things so you who believe in the name of the Son of God may know that everything between you and God is fine as far as eternity is concerned. Amazing. And notice what else. He says, not only that you may know that you have eternal life, but he says, and, and, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So he's saying, listen, you believe in him for eternal life and get eternal life, but you know what you can continue to do as Christians? You can continue to put faith in that very same thing for other things. You can grow in your faith. You can put your faith in Jesus for more and more things. Like, for instance, you can put your faith in Jesus for how you give to God's kingdom work. See, when you first get saved, generally you're not given diddly squat. You know, I didn't give anything to God's work the first year I was saved. And then it dawned on me, oh my goodness, how did I miss that? They were doing it every week. A guy would get up and say, hey, listen, you need to be supporting God's work. And it went in one ear and out the other. And then finally, the Holy Spirit convicts me. But you know what? It so convicted me that I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I've been saved a year, and I've, I haven't given you anything, and I'm going to make that up, Lord. I'm going to make that up. What I made this past year, I'm going to add that to what I'm going to start giving, and I'm going to make up for what I did the first year that I was saved and I didn't give anything. So you can have, see what happens is your faith is here as a believer, my, or my faith was here, but then it moved up. I can continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. I was trusting him for a new, another area. And then later on I got married, so I had to trust him even more so that I might be a good spouse. And so I had to learn his principles about marriage. And then I learned some more. So that's what Christian life, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe. You may continue to put your faith in the name of the Son of God as a believer. Verse 14. This is the crux of the message today. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. We're going to come back to that. What does that mean? Does that mean that God will answer every prayer that we ask? We're going to find out. But I want to start with a story, as I typically do. The author, Donald Miller, he was writing for a Christian magazine, and he wrote the following piercing article. I call it a piercing article because it's so convicting. He said this, I lived for a time with my friend and mentor, John McMurray, where the first rule was to always tell the truth. John and I were sitting in the family room one night when he asked me about my new cell phone. 
I told him, I got it free. How did you get it for free? He said, well, my other one broke. So I took it to see if they could replace it. They had this new computer system at the store, and they didn't have their records. They didn't know whether mine was still under warranty or not. I knew it wasn't because it was more than a year that I had it. The guy asked me about it, and I told him I didn't know, but it was right around a year. Just a white lie, you know. Anyway, the phone was so messed up that they replaced it with a newer model, so I got a free phone. At this point, (laughs) Donald Miller's spiritual mentor asks him a question. He says, Donald, did you ever see that movie, The Family Man? You ever see the movie The Family Man with Nicolas Cage? There's that scene where Nicolas Cage walks into a store to get a cup of coffee. And Don Chadal plays the guy working at the counter. There's a guy or girl in line in front of Nicolas Cage, and she's buying something for 99 cents. And she hands Chadal a dollar. Chadal takes $9 out of the cash register, and he counts it out, giving her way too much money. She'd only be giving her a penny, and he counts out nine singles, and he puts them down there on the counter. And Nicolas Cage is standing behind the girl. He's watching all of this happen. And so he gives her $9, and she sees that he's handing her way too much money, yet she picks it up and puts it in her pocket without saying a word. As she's walking out the door, Tadal stops her to give her another chance. He asks her if there's anything else she needs. She shakes her head no and walks out. Miller says to his mentor, I see what you're getting at, John. His mentor says, let me finish. So Chadal looks over at Nicolas Cage, or I should say Cheadle. His name is Cheadle, okay. Cheadle looks over at Nicolas Cage and he says, did you see that? She was willing to sell her character for $9. $9. After a little while, Donald uh, spoke up and he said this. You think that's what I'm doing with the phone? You think I'm selling my character? And I said it with a smirk. He didn't like what his mentor said to him. I do, said John. The Bible talks about having a calloused heart. That's when sin over a period of time has so deceived us that we no longer care whether our thoughts or our actions are right or wrong. Our hearts will go there easily and often over what looks like little things, little white lies. All I am saying to you as your friend is this. Watch for this kind of thing. Watch for this kind of thing. So when Miller ends his article, Donald Miller is finishing this article now in this Christian magazine, And these are the words that he finished with. Let me put them on the screen. I went back to the store the next day. It cost me more than $9, but I got my character back. It cost me more than $9, but I got my character back. Now, folks, I don't have to tell you at all that we live in a world where integrity and honesty even in the lives of believers, are nearly non-existent. In fact, most of the time, people are thrilled when mistakes are made in their favor, and they look at dishonest gain as if it was a gift from God. Oh, wow, they gave me $10 too much. Thank you, Lord. Now, when an unbeliever is thrilled about cheating... It doesn't surprise me. Unbelievers have bigger problems than just being dishonest, like being eternally condemned. 
But we are here today, everybody, as God's people. And God has much different expectations for us. So, in light of that this morning, in light of that story I just told, in light of the fact that God wants us to be people of honesty and openness, I'd like us to look at this from a different angle, this concept of spiritual victory. You know, we're talking about victory in Jesus now at the close of the summer. We're looking at this idea of being victorious over sin and even being victorious over suffering, though that's not the key idea that we're speaking of. But if we're going to be victorious over sin, we're going to look at it from a much different angle this morning, okay? And I want to do the, what I want to do this morning, I want to give you two simple principles. It's not going to be like you've learned anything new, but when you think of these in light of spiritual victory, you're going to say, ah, thanks, I needed that. These two principles, we need to not only know them, we need to live by them, listen to me, if we are going to walk in victory. Do you need victory today in your life? Do you need victory today in your marriage? Do you need victory today in relationships, maybe with your children, maybe with uh, people at work? Do you need victory? Listen, two simple, two simple principles. I want to talk to you today about that very thing, and here's the title, Two Vital Principles Regarding Spiritual Victory. Let's take a moment and pray. We'll get right back into this topic. Father, use these things in the lives and hearts of your people. God, we just ask that their minds will, will see this, these principles, and they'll just recognize, wow, I needed this so badly, and I didn't even realize it. Father, help all of us, including me, Father. And we pray these things in your precious name and for your sake. Amen. All right, I'd like to go all the way back to 2003. Doesn't that sound crazy? You're like, 2003? That was just a few years ago. <laughs> no? Madeline, how old were you in 2003? A year? Oh, you were zero? <laughs> See, Madeline's married. and <laughs> She was born in 2003. So, so you get where I'm coming from. Some of us sit here and think, 2003, well, that was just a few. No, it was 17, 18, 18 years ago. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I want you to go to, to Miami in your mind. I want you to go to the second playoff hole. If you're watching golf on TV, when you get to the end of the golf game, and if there's two people that have tied or even three people or more, they always have a playoff. So they go to the next hole. They go to a hole. They're told which hole they're going to play. They play it just like they normally do, and they get on the green. And let's say one guy could hit it in with just one putt, and the other guy, it takes him two or three. The guy that could get it in with the least number of putts is going to be the winner. Okay, so here's what happened. It came down, the first, first playoff hole, they tied. The second playoff hole, let me put his picture up there. This is a guy named Scott Hoke. Scott Hoke. He was 47 in, 19, or in 2003. On the first playoff hole, he and the other guy tied. They tied. And it's getting really late on Sunday evening. It's Miami. The sun's going down pretty quickly. And so it's, it's getting dark. And he's had five eye surgeries. So he gets out there on that second playoff hole, and he's looking. He's, his ball's here, and the hole's over here. And I think it was a nine-foot putt. Yeah, nine-foot putt. And to win, he's got to make this putt. And he's looking, and he's looking, and he's had these eye surgeries, and he just says... Listen, I can't, I can't hit this today. I can't tell whether the green's breaking right or if it's breaking left. And he tells the people in charge, I would like to postpone my putt till tomorrow because I can't see it. And they're, a, they're able to do that. That's part of the rules. But listen, 
NBC went bananas because they're, <laughs> they want this thing. And NBC's going bananas. Think of all of the things that have to happen. The people have to stay there an extra day with the cameras and everything. And it just, listen, all the people there that had to go back to work on Monday, guess what they didn't get to see? Who won the golf game? They were expecting to be able to cheer. No, you know what? A lot of them had to go back to work. So you can imagine how crazy it was. There was a lot of mad people. But Scott Hoke was really smart because you know what? He thought that it was going to be, and by the way, he was really smart because guess how much he earned by making that birdie putt the next morning? He waited, knocked it in the hole, nine feet, and that's a good ways away. I mean, that's a long putt, a pretty long putt. Nine hundred thousand dollars. One putt. He made a birdie. And the other guy just parred it, and so he was one shot less than that other guy, and he won the tournament. And guess what he found out the next day? The night before in the darkness, he said, man, I know that this green is going left. It's good. When, I, when I hit the ball, it's going to go curve. It's going to curve to the right. And his caddy said, no, it's going right. Okay? So... The next day, his caddy convinced him, and guess what? He listened to his caddy, and the caddy was right. It wasn't going this way. It was going that way. His ball curved right into the hole, won 900,000. How many of you want to be professional golfers? Do I, can I see some? Man? <laughs> man, I would love to be able just to make one putt and make a million dollars. That would be really sweet. But anyway, but that's not going to happen. I'm going to do that in heaven. It's going to be great. <laughs> hole in one. <laughs> hole in one. <laughs> hole in one. No, no, no that's, not, that's not true. That's not going to happen. It'll be just like we play it on earth if they have golf up there, and they probably will. If they're not, a lot of Christian golfers will be upset. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I love that story. I love that story. But you know what? In 1 John, one of the things we saw there is this contrast between light and darkness. The importance of light and the and the uh, dread and the fear of the darkness, of walking. See, right now, that guy's walking in the light. Here's God, and here's this believer, and he's saying, Lord, I'll be honest with you. If you show me my sin, I'll confess it, and I'll make it right. And he's open. you got to be open. Okay, like, for instance, we can't read our Bibles and say, hey, Lord, uh, you know what, I'll read the Bible, but if you, if you convict me of some sin, I'm not going to confess it. I'm just going to keep doing it. That guy will move from here to here because he's going to be, at that point, walking in the darkness. What God requires is to walk in the light, okay? There it is, okay? If we walk in the light... As he is. Is God honest? Is he authentic? Is he open? Yes, he is. And we need to be like God. So what does John mean when he says that we are to walk in the light? Okay? I've already said it several times. To walk in the light is, let me go back, to walk in the light is to walk in openness and honesty to all that God's word might reveal to us. That's the first principle that I said this morning. If you're going to have spiritual victory, principle number one, you have to walk in the light in openness and honesty to all that God's word might reveal to you. That's just what God requires because he says, if, if we walk in the light, what does, hey, what does that imply, if we walk in the light? It implies that we may not do it. If we walk, it's contingent. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God. Now, again, it doesn't say we have eternal life. It says we have fellowship. We have closeness. We, we're close to our heavenly father. Okay? Look, all of us that are parents realize, especially if you have a large family, hey, there's some children that you may just be closer to than others. Like if you have 
children that, listen, they don't give you the time of day. Well, how's your relationship? How close are you going to be with that child? How you doing? Ah, it doesn't matter. Uh, and, and, you know, they're blowing you off all the time, and they don't ever listen to anything you say. You know, that, that's not just, just not going to be a very good, they're still your child. Just like we don't lose our salvation if we're not listening to God, but you do lose your closeness. And that, that just is really sad because you can't have the abundant life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life, eternal life, and I've come to give you what? More abundantly. He says, I don't want you just to exist down there in the dark. <laughs> I want you to have life more abundantly, okay? Now, there's three basic things. We've already talked about two of them in the previous weeks. I'm just going to go real quickly kind of to review, okay? Three basic things that, we, that God's uh, word shines on us and reveals to us, okay? The first week and the second week, we talked about this one. The light of God's word reveals the glory of Christ, okay? The light of God's word reveals the glory of Christ, his majestic character. 2 Corinthians 3.18. You look in the mirror with your unveiled face as a believer, and you look in the mirror of God's word, and you see his glory, and guess what? Miraculously, the Holy Spirit transforms you into his image from glory to glory to glory throughout your life. When you're first saved, you don't have a lot of Jesus' glory in your life. Then you live a little bit longer and walk with God, you've got more and more and more. Even, the verse says, as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's by God's Spirit, okay? That's the first thing that God's Word reveals as it shines on us. But what's the second one? The second one is what I talked about two weeks ago, our identity in Christ. Remember I talked about the face of our birth, our birth face, who we are in Christ? By the way, I've got a, I got a, a beautiful document I want to send in the email to all of you because it's one of the best, um, one of the best documents, one of the best uh, Bible studies. It's probably like 10 pages long. But this brother with Cru Campus Crusade, well, they call it Crew now, with the organization Crew, it used to be Campus Crusade for Christ, he wrote out who we are in Christ. And man, is it ever excellent. He breaks it down into like six different categories, tons of scripture, and man, it just makes you come alive because, man, God made me, when I was born, I got a new life in me through Jesus, and I have this, and I have this, and I have this, and all of our wonderful position in Christ, in Christ, hallelujah, meaning, hey, I read, I don't remember if it was in that article, I think it was, but he talked about, hey, you have a book, it's open, and you put a, a bookmark inside the book, and you close the book, where's the bookmark? In the book, it's in the book. When you got saved, where did God put you? In Christ. In Christ. Jesus said that God puts, God gives, all the Father gives to me shall come to me, and whoever comes to me I will in no wise cast out. He talks about in John, you're in my hand and no one will be able to pluck you out of my hand. You're in Christ. No one can pluck you out of my hand. You can't even pluck yourself out. You say, but I don't want to be saved anymore. Tough luck. He gave you eternal life. You're going to live forever with him. You, nothing you can do about it. He says, listen, when he says, no one, no man, no one can pluck you out of my hand, he's even talking about you. Because that would not be true if you could pluck yourself out by doing this or that. Now, listen. You do evil, and whatever a person sows, that what you're gonna, that's what you're going to reap, man. It's going to be painful. So that's the second thing, who we are in Christ. First, the glory of Christ. The Bible shows us the glory of Christ. It shows us our identity in Christ. And then thirdly, it shows us the presence of sin in our lives. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the presence of sin in our lives, okay? So... 
Let me go ahead and reiterate this first principle. I already did early, earlier, but let me reiterate it to you. Principle number one, spiritual victory is only possible when we are open and honest to all God reveals to us in his word. Okay? That's crucial. Okay? Uh, uh, Donald Miller talked about a little white lie, okay, in the phone store. That is just a little white lie. That's not being open and honest with God. So can we as believers have victory when we know we're disobeying God? If we're in the darkness, <laughs> here's God shining the light, his light through his word. That's the only place that you're going to see God's light shined into your heart is through his word, okay? If you are over here saying, well, it was just a little white lie. Oh, it was just a one-night fling. Oh, it was just, you get the idea? If you're, if you're denying it, if you're not being truthful before God, you can't have spiritual victory. You're going to live in, in, in no man's land over here. That's no, that's no fun. That's not abundant living. So we have to learn this principle, everybody. We have to live. If you're in denial, the obvious answer is to can you have spiritual victory? The obvious answer is no. Okay? Plato, the Greek philosopher, he uh, lived uh, 400 years before Christ down there on the bottom, if you'll notice. Oops. Sorry. He lived 400 B.C. He was a philosopher he said, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men or people are afraid of the light. Oh, Whew. we can't be afraid of the light, everybody. We have to let God's light shine on us, okay? So, uh, we've got to walk open and honestly before God. Confess our sins. If we confess them, he's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us. Don't be afraid to come into the light because when you admit it, when you acknowledge your sin to God, he's faithful. And listen to this, he's just. He doesn't impugn his own holiness. He doesn't, when he forgives you, it's not like, oh, look, God's, God's that's, not, that's not cool what God did, just forgave that person for their evil. no. He's faithful and just. He does not ruin his own righteousness and holiness by forgiving you of your sins, okay? All right, well, let's wrap this up. We looked at the first chapter, 1 John 1, but what about that second chapter we read about earlier, okay? These things I've written to you, 1 John 5, 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may, number one, know that you have eternal life. Okay, you've believed in the name of the Son of God. Then you know you have eternal life. And that you may continue to believe. We talked about this earlier. Remember? More and more faith. You remember when the guy, okay, I'm going to teach you something here. Don't ever forget this. Because this, so many Christians are confused about this passage. Remember when the guy said, Lord, uh, um, I believe Help thou my unbelief. Or another person said something like, Lord, uh, uh, what was the one? Somebody refresh me. Where he said, uh, Lord, give me greater faith or something. What did that verse say? You remember he says, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And then there's another one. He says, Lord, increase our faith. Lord, increase our faith. Okay. Let me tell you what that means. What does God mean when the Bible says increase our faith? It doesn't mean this. Oh, Lord, I, I'm believing in you right now, but I need Ed Sullivan faith. I need really big faith. We're going to have a really big faith tonight. I need really big faith. I need... No, 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 no. That's not what God's talking about. It's like where you work it up and you have this big... No, that's not what he means. What God means is this. Right now, you're only believing this much of my word. Help me to believe. See, Jesus was asking, Jesus was calling this guy to move up, to believe him for something bigger, to be obedient in a new area. And you know what? That's tough. That's tough. And so, what happens is, everybody, is that guy was saying, Lord, increase my faith. Help me, Lord, to believe you for that matter. For instance, like money. That's so hard. Do you know that 
Christians, that, that charitable giving like among God's people has gone down under 2% now. Under 2% of their annual income. That's horrible. That's horrible. Only that little tiny bit. You know what? That's where you say, Lord, help me to trust you, to take care of me when I give more to God's kingdom. You get the idea, okay? So, now, if you go from verse 13 here to the next verse, we get an idea of what he's talking about. You can continue to believe in him in this context. Now, you could make it apply to the whole Bible for your marriage, for your finances, for your children, for relationships, so on and so forth. But watch what John's going to focus in on here. Do you know what God wants your faith to increase in? Notice this, the very next verse. Now. You can continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So he's talking about answers to prayer. Answers to prayer. You know what? Christians, God says to us, you're not trusting me in the matter of answers to your prayers, especially for spiritual victory. If you'll just, okay, question, is it God's will for all of us to be spiritually victorious? Absolutely. And God says, that's his will. And he says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we asked of him. He says, this is, okay, so this is another key issue over this whole series on victory in Jesus. And what is it? I'm telling you this. This key principle, let me, I, I'm, gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just show you this. What God's not saying here is he's not saying whatever you ask, period. Right? Whatever you ask, God will give it to you. Oh, Lord, give me a new car. Bing! Whoa! Because you said, Lord, you said whatever we ask, uh, if we ask anything, he hears us. And if whatever we ask, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition. No, no, it doesn't say that. What's, what's the key phrase in there that you're missing? Okay, let me put it up the next slide. That's right. If we ask anything according to his will. And where we find God's will is in God's word. It's the black and white of God's word. But guess what? Spiritual victory is one of those things. Spiritual victory, God says, I want you to have spiritual victory. And if you'll ask me, now this is one principle, 2 Corinthians 3, if you're letting the word get into your mind, unveiled face, be authentic, let the word get in. Okay, so that's a principle. You, you can't be spiritually victorious without God's word. But you can't be spiritually victorious if you're walking in darkness or if you're not asking God. We've got to ask God and say, Lord, I'm in your word. I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to study it. I'm trying to grow in your word. Lord, open your word to me. Will God answer that prayer? Hey, listen, maybe not overnight. If you say, oh, Lord, give me spiritual victory, Do, are the very next day, are you like, uh, are you Superman spiritually? No. But guess what? Just like a lot of our praying, in God's good time, little by little, pray, 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 and God comes to our rescue. Okay? So if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Question. Is God's will for those of us that are married to have excellent, God-honoring marriages? Yes. It's his will. So ask him. Ask him. Does he want you to have good relationships with your children? Yes. Ask him. Ask him. And if we ask anything according to his will, he is going to intervene. He's going to work. Okay? He's going to hear our prayers. And we can know for sure that in time, those prayers will come to pass. I did a sermon about this many years ago, and I called it the billion-dollar promise. <laughs> That's an amazing promise for God. So this is the last, 
the last uh, principle here, and then it's time for us to, to close out the service today. But here's principle number two. Spiritual victory is only possible when we are seeking God for it in prayer. Spiritual victory is only possible when we're seeking God for it in prayer. Now, can I just pray for it and not read the Bible? No. No, because God told us that's part of this equation for spiritual victory. Got to read the Bible. Can I, can I just pray for it and then walk in darkness? Walk in evil? Like, well, Lord, you know I'm uh, having a secret affair, but, you know, Lord, uh, it's just a little white secret affair. It's not a big, great big one, you know. Okay, no. Uh, Lord, I'm taking cash out of the company's cash registers and sticking it in my pocket every day, a little here, a little there. But you know what, Lord? Man, they make millions of dollars. What's, what's $100 here? And Okay. That's not walking in the light. So you can't expect to be, how can you walk in spiritual victory? How can you have spiritual victory when you're walking in spiritual defeat and in, in rebellion against God? It doesn't work that way. So you got all these ingredients. Didn't I tell you it's going to be a series on spiritual victory? Yeah. Okay. You know what's interesting? When you read uh, Ephesians 6, what's Ephesians 6 uh, famous for? Putting on the armor, putting on the armor, putting on the armor. You know what's so cool? You get to that place right after Paul talks about the armor, and he says this. He says, praying always. Put on the armor, praying always with all prayer and supplication. That means like really crying out to God in the spirit and being watchful, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We need to pray for the spiritual victory of one another. But isn't that interesting? Where Paul says, you want to be a soldier of mine? You want to wear my uniform? You want to do business for me? Do you want to win the war to help me win this war we're fighting for the souls of human beings, for the eternal souls of people? Then you need to be praying for victory and you need to be praying for the, for the other people, for all saints, okay? Do you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant one day? Do you want to overcome sin the sin that so easily ensnares you? Do you want to be a victor or do you want to be one of Satan's victims? Do you want your kids and your grandkids to be champions for God or do you want to see them swallowed up by the world system, by a society whose goals and values are Satan's? If you want to be a victor, those things won't happen apart from prayer. So let me close in asking you a story, or asking you a question, and then a short story. What sin, what is the sin that so easily ensnares you? The Bible talks about all of us have these sins that so easily ensnare us, okay? Now, in Hebrews, it's pretty obvious he's talking about faith, because you know what these people in Hebrews were doing? They're thrown in the towel. They I've served God long enough. I'm finished. I can't take it anymore. And they walk away from God. I'm getting too persecuted. I'm done. And see, they, the, the sin that so easily ensnared them was unbelief. Lack of faith in God. But you know what? How about, how about you? Lust. Pride. Is it anger? Is it drunkenness? Is it drug abuse? Is it pornography? Is it lying? Is it stealing? Is it gossip? Is it overeating? Question, is it God's will that you overcome this sin that so easily ensnares you? Yes. Then, if you ask him for total and complete delivery over that sin, is he obligated to do that for you? Yes, he is, because he says, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it for you. He is obligated to, at some point in the future, give you victory over that very thing that so easily ensnares you. You can ask God, and you can know that he will do it, because that's his will. So whatever 
Whatever chain. Hey, listen, you might have 15 or 20 chains on your ankles of all kinds of things that hold you down for God. May not just be one or two or three things. It might be a bunch of things. But guess what? Start asking God. Set me free, God. Set me free, God, and he'll do it. Okay, one more story, and then we're going to pray. Those little devotionals we have out in the hallway called Our Daily Bread, they have little stories in them. Years ago, I read this story about Alexander Solzhenitsyn's book, the Russian writer, the Russian philosopher, and he wrote this book entitled uh, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Okay? Denisovich. The a Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Okay, Russian name. Ivan endures all the horrors of a Soviet prison camp. And it's really, really bad. But one day he's praying in the prison. And he's got his eyes closed as he's praying. And another prisoner, so belligerent, bark, barks out to Ivan. He says, Prayers won't help you to get out of here any faster. Prayers won't help you get out of here any faster. Opening his eyes, Ivan say, says to him the following words. He says, I do not pray to get out of prison but to do the will of God. I do not pray to get out of prison. I pray to do the will of God. And my brothers and sisters, that is what we all need to be praying. All of us. I need to be praying it. You need to be praying it. We all need to be praying it. Why? Because we desperately need this, everybody. We have to overcome. Why? For Jesus' sake, for the kingdom. Listen, you're not just coming here for, for, uh, to church just, just to have fellowship with other people to get to know. You're coming here because we're trying to train you to be overcomers, to train you to be victorious, to train you to be uh, more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're already that in Christ. But we've got to learn to live out who we are in Christ. Jesus already said, you're more than a conqueror. Now I want you to live like one. Seek me for that. Cry out to me for that. Oh, God wants to help all of us. But you know what? We just don't listen to God. We don't just pray. We just don't get in his word. That's our problem. That's our problem. And you know what another problem that there might be? I don't know if anybody in this room is in, in this situation. Maybe s some of you that are listening from afar or watching this on YouTube. But it could be that you may need eternal life. Maybe all your life you've thought that your good deeds will save you. But the truth of the matter is, good deeds have never saved anybody in the, in the history, and they will never save anybody in the future. The Bible says, not by works, lest anyone should boast, lest anyone should brag. God's never, ever given. The Bible says eternal life is a gift. So if you've never put your faith in Jesus... I highly, highly recommend you to take him at his word. You realize you, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And you say, yes, that's true, Lord. I've fallen short of the glory. I've sinned, Lord. What do I do? Well, the Bible answer is the only one that will help you. And the answer the Bible gives to that problem, the sin problem, is this. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. 
you will never go to hell. You will go to be with God forever. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith in what he says and not the opinion of everybody around you. Human opinions don't get anybody into heaven. God's word, the promise is a God's word. You take God, his promise at face value, boom. The minute you do that, you'll, you have eternal life that very minute. Jesus says, whoever believes in me has eternal life, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You have it. It's not you're going to wait to get it. Whoever believes in me, Jesus says, has everlasting life. So put your trust, put your faith in the Lord Jesus, and he'll give you the free gift of everlasting life. Let's, let's bow our heads for prayer, everyone. Thank you so much. Let's bow our heads. Right now, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, if you don't know 100% for sure that your sins are forgiven and that your home will be heaven forever and ever, right this moment, believe. Believe the words of our Lord Jesus. Put your faith in what he says. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Whoever believes in me, he says, will not perish in hell, but have everlasting life. The moment you believe Jesus' promise, he gives you the gift of everlasting life. Father, we come to you as your people. And Lord, we're so thankful for your word. It tells us how that we could have eternal life, and it tells us how we can have victorious life the abundant life, walking with you, walking in fellowship, walking in the light, it tells us that that is through confessing our sins and for asking you for the victory we so desperately need. Lord, just two simple principles, but God help us to take those to heart. Bless all of the church family. Help them to begin to practice this this very day. Help them to begin to practice this, this very day, Father. And Jesus, we ask these things in your precious name and for your sake. Amen. All right, listen, everybody, I know that you've been doing this. Please continue to pray for the Crabtree family. You know, this past Monday, Brother Gary lost his precious wife of 55 years. And you know what? He needs our continued prayer. Leslie, their daughter, and all of the children, all the grandchildren, uh, the great-grandchildren, they lost their precious, precious Nana. And we just pray that uh, God will sustain them. Gary, we love you, Leslie, if you're watching. And hang in there. And if you can make it to the funeral tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. at um, Williams Funeral Home, that would be great. If, if you're not having and you're not obligated to work and you could do that, be a blessing to the Crabtree family. 10.30 a.m., and you could, you're welcome to come an hour earlier. They're going to open the doors at 9.30. But uh, no viewing, uh, but uh, you can come and, and be a blessing to other people and to the Crabtree. So, all right. Thank you so much, everybody. Don't forget this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we're going to have our Bible study online. And so thank you so much. You can stand. And let's take a moment to share uh, and to greet one another. And have a great week, everybody. We'll see you very soon.